Hi guys, so we're going to start today with um, articulations. This is um, another word for joints. So this one has a outline, so please follow along. The first thing about joints is that they're classified according to their um, function and they're classified according to their structure. So function means how movable are the two bones when they come together and form that joint. So it turns out that some joints are synarthrotic and they do not, the bones do not move when they are joined together. Some are amphiarthrotic and the, the bones are slightly movable. And then some are diarthrotic where they are freely movable. Now our freely movable joints are synovial joints. So we can kind of put those two terms together in our mind that all synovial joints are diarthrotic. We can also put together, um, or we classify joints according to how the bones are tied together, like what material is going to bind the bones. So um, let's not do that. So we have fibrous joints where fibrous connective tissue joins the two bones together. Cartilage, hyaline and fibrous cartilage, putting the bones together. And then our last category, which is synovial joints, which is unique and they have different um, characteristics. So let's look at, um, we're going to move through this lecture looking at um, the structure, the structural classification. So we're going to begin with um, fibrous joints and fibrous joints are joined by this dense fibrous connective tissue. So definitely connective tissue. Um, and an example of fibrous joints are sutures, syndesmoses, and gomphoses. So let's move through each one. You're probably familiar with sutures since we learned them on the skull and they're only present on the skull and in the face. Um, the sutures are immovable, right? So they're a synarthrotic joint. The periosteum of your bone is going to continue on and just come into the fill in this junction between the two bones and then move on to become the periosteum of the next bone. So sutures are immovable, connective tissue is present. When we're born though, the skull is not completely fused together um, and we have these gaps, um, these soft membranous gaps um, called fontanelles. So what this material is connective tissue and we call them soft spots when babies are born. We can actually see the outline of the soft spot in this baby's head. And the reason is for, there's two reasons why infants are born this way. Um, number one is that, you know, humans have evolved very big heads. We have very big brains and it kind of outpaced the, um, the vaginal canal and the hips um, for the women having babies. And so babies have to be born with skulls that are pretty malleable, meaning flexible, um, so they can fit through the birth canal. I'm sure we've seen babies born with um, elongated cone heads because of this, right? So for birth, we need to have fontanelles. And then babies' heads are small, adults' heads are big, right? There has to be room to accommodate the rapid growth in the brain. Um, if you think about the size of the head of a toddler, it's pretty big relative to the body size, right? So we want to leave a lot of room and flexibility for rapid brain growth, okay? So those are the two reasons why we have fontanelles. These are just some fun pictures of how malleable the skulls of um, babies and uh, little toddlers are, right? We can see that this baby has been put to sleep on his back night after night after night, and just the pressure of his head resting on the, the mattress is enough to move the bones so it creates a flat region. Um, doctors may prescribe a, a helmet so that um, the skull can maintain a, a round shape. All right, our second um, fibrous joint is going to be a syndesmosis, and a syndesmosis is another word for ligament. So when you bind two bones together, um, the connective tissue here, right, is our ligament. This is our dense, regular connective tissue. And we find this between the radius and ulna and also between the tibia and fibula. This would be the distal end of our tibia and fibula, right? This is at our ankle. A gomphosis, it might surprise you that your teeth are 
embedded in your mandible and also in your maxilla, but held in place by a ligament. So it's called the periodontal ligament. And this is the reason why if you have chronic tooth decay, um, you can lose your teeth because the infection can start to erode the gum. The infection can move between the tooth and the bone. And then once it gets into this area, it can start to erode the connective tissue. So it's just soft connective tissue that keeps your tooth in the um, socket. Therefore, um, it's possible to lose your teeth with infection. All right, so those are the three examples of a fibrous, uh, fibrous joints in our body. The next category is cartilaginous joints. So cartilaginous joints, there are two kinds, the synchondroses, as you can see here, um, and symphysis. Notice the chondro root word, right? That means cartilage. And synchondroses is only one kind of cartilage, hyaline cartilage. Now, don't think about your articular cartilages, which are hyaline cartilage. The articular cartilages are going to be found in synovial joints. Where do we have hyaline cartilage outside of our synovial joints? We have it um, in two places. So this is an example of an epiphyseal plate, right? Or this is an epiphyseal plate. And technically speaking, we do have hyaline cartilage that's helping to bind one area of bone with another area of bone. So technically speaking, this is a synchondrosis. Now, what happens when the epiphyseal plate ossifies when you stop growing and it becomes an epiphyseal line. You no longer have a synchondrosis, you have a synostosis where it's completely bone. So in the outline you'll find these two terms bolded. Another place you have hyaline cartilage is between the sternum and the first rib. So this is another synchondrosis. The symphysis term is going to be fibrocartilage. Okay, so fibrocartilage is found two places in the body in, in terms of um, the uh, sy symphysis. The intervertebral discs is a symphysis, and then the pubic symphysis is a symphysis. Both of these guys are slightly movable. Both of these guys are, are considered amphiarthrotic. But I want you guys, I want to walk through um, the intervertebral disc real quick. So under the intervertebral disc, in your outline, there's two terms, annulus fibrosis and nucleus pulposus. The annulus fibrosis is this fibrous cartilage, but the fibrocartilage is arranged in these concentric circles around the exterior, around the outside of your intervertebral disc. And then inside, in the middle, you have a nucleus pulposus. The nucleus pulposus is like a gel, and this is the um, substance that is actually very um, absorbing of compressive forces. So it's um, what can provide the resilience um, to compressive forces in the back. Over time, you can have something called disc degeneration. And this is just from normal aging that, you know, we talked about how your cells, as, you, as we all age, um, they don't replace um, dead cells or they don't repair as well. They don't maintain the tissues as well. So this also occurs with the intervertebral discs. So the annulus fibrosis over time may become thin and start to break down. And then it allows for the nucleus pulposus because we're pushing on that all the time. The pressure that you put on the nucleus pulposus in all directions will start to um, push on one part of this annulus. And what could happen is you could bulge, have a disc bulge. So imagine most of your life, what direction are you actually um, flexing your, are you sort of flexing down or are most of your actions in this backward, backward arch, right? We don't really arch our back all that much unless you're in gymnastics or you are a doing yoga all, every day. But most of the time, the most natural position that we, when we bend is to bend forward, like when we're driving or typing or tying our shoe or picking something up from the ground. So we have a lot of this downward force in the anterior part of our you know, vertebral column. This squishes down on the front of our intervertebral disc. And what that does is it pushes the nucleus backwards. Okay, so the nucleus pulposus 
is going to get pushed posteriorly. So what that does is if your annulus fibrosis is weak or if it's broken down, then you can start to get a bulge, right? So this bulge can push on the nerve roots that exit the spinal cord and it, it can cause pain from that point on. So wherever that nerve goes, you can feel pain. So if you have compressive forces in the neck or uh, you can feel pain down the arm, compressive forces in the lower back can lead to pain down the leg. Uh, a more severe form of this is disc herniation, where you actually have a rupture of the annulus fibrosis and the nucleus pulposus is actually being extruded. So um, all of these, uh, you know, bulging and disc herniation, there are um, therapies for, there is physical therapy as well as um, surgical intervention. Um, but <clears throat> this is something that happens. So disc degeneration gener happens over a lifetime, it's inevitable, um, but you can also get disc bulges and herniations through um, lifting something up improperly. So if you're young and healthy, um, but you lift something improperly, you can also create a slipped disc. So this bulge is sometimes referred to as a slipped disc, okay? Um, let me show you an x-ray. This is my brother's x-ray. Um, he was fairly young when he had this um, herniated disc or slipped disc. Um, he would picked up, some, up a, a weight um, improperly. So I'm going um, to, hopefully you located the slipped disc and I'll, I'll outline it right now. It's right in here, right? And notice that this is the, the lumbar curvature. So it happened in the lumbar region of his back. And we can see how much that disc has bulged out and this white area, right, that's the, the nerves. So um, a lot of, he was in a lot of pain um, and had to get pain medication, but no surgical intervention. At this point, his, it, wasn't as, it wasn't severe enough to um, warrant surgery. All right, moving on to the last um, joint is synovial joint. So synovial joints um, have a couple of characteristics. They always have a fluid-filled joint cavity, and they always have a membrane called the synovial membrane lining that joint cavity, creating synovial fluid. So take a look at this picture. We have, if you are trying to figure out what joint this is, this is the shoulder, because this is the head of our humerus, okay? And this is the glenoid cavity of our scapula. Notice we do have a cavity between the bones. So within synovial joints, the two bones do not touch. That is not something that synovial joints are built to do. Um, synovial joints keep the bones apart. They keep the bones apart with this cavity. They keep the bones apart by lining each bone with articular cartilage. Um, and there's fluid also within this cavity, the synovial fluid. So let's pause and see if you guys can answer this question. So you should have, through process of elimination, it's the tibia and fibula are, this is a ligament, right? It's a ligament that holds those two together. And a ligament is not cartilage. So this chondro root tells me that this has something to do with cartilage and that's not it. Synostosis, osto refers to bone, that's not it. So we're down to syndesmosis and symphysis. Hopefully you can keep in mind that pubic symphysis, since it has the same name, this is a fibrocartilage joint. So our answer is syndesmosis. All right, looking at a generic um, synovial joint, notice that we have this joint capsule. So a capsule, letter B in your outline, is made of this fibrous connective tissue the periosteum on one bone continues on and forms our joint capsule and then becomes the periosteum of the next bone. So um, that is the outer layer of our joint capsule is this dense connective tissue. The inside of the joint capsule is synovial membrane, right? So that's the pink um, substance that you see here. It lines the entire um, cavity and it secretes synovial fluid. 
right? So the synovial membrane secretes synovial fluid. Synovial fluid, the word ovial refers to ovum or egg. So someone thought that the fluid felt like egg white. So you, feel, you know, egg white is very slippery and thick. So that material lubricates the joint. It lubricates your synovial joint. It helps the um, bones move smoothly without friction. So it reduces friction. Friction is always bad because it can, um, uh, you know, obviously like uh, tear, you know, tissue. It can damage the tissue within whatever is, um, ha has the friction. All right, so the synovial fluid, um, letter D, it lubricates the joint. It also nourishes the chondrocytes. So what chondrocytes I'm talking about are the cartilage cells of the articular cartilage. So remember chondrocytes are avascular. There's no blood going directly here to the cartilage, but it's washed with fluid. So when you move your joints, the compressive forces of the movement of the, uh, the synovial fluid can actually push into the cartilage and nourish the chondrocytes this way. Um, and then also the fluid absorbs shock. All right, moving on to the next uh, articular cartilage. So articular cartilages, we can see are part of your synovial joint. So the bones protect themselves again with that articular cartilage. And then uh, the fluid we talked about. So synovial joints, since the bones are not physically connected, um, there's a gap or a joint cavity between them. That's what gives them that mobility and the freely moving, um, the, freely mo the free mobility but also when you have bones that ha are freely movable, they need to be reinforced. So the, the structural integrity of the joint is reinforced by ligaments. If the ligaments are inside the joint cavity, then we are, they're called intrinsic ligaments, such as the ACL and PCL of the knee. If those ligaments are outside the joint, they're called extrinsic ligaments. So just some terminology. Menisci, or um, if single meniscus, are pads of fibrocartilage that help to help bones fit better um, when they form that joint. So um, let's look at the, the meniscus of the temporomandibular joint. So this is the TMJ, temporomandibular joint. And we can see that the condyle of the mandible um, is you know, fitting into the mandibular fossa of our temporal bone and there is a little piece of cartilage between the two because every time you talk or chew, right, we have movement here and we want to help those bones fit better together so when they move you're going to limit the amount of um, um, force on just one part of that joint and help the bones glide better. The knee is a really good example of uh, a joint that requires a meniscus. So remember that the head of the tibia is quite flat and the condyles of the femur are quite round, right? So how is it that this round femur, condyles of the femur, helps to <laughs> fit on our flat tibia? Well, we need this meniscus. So we have these curved pieces of fibrocartilage that come in, right, like this, and they're going to help cradle the condyles of your femur so they don't um, they don't have direct pressure on one part of the tibia so it's going to disperse the load right so think about your body weight coming from your femur if you didn't have a meniscus the point of the femur here would land the, all that force would land just on one spot of your tibia but because we have a meniscus we can evenly distribute that load um, onto the entire meniscus and therefore evenly distribute that load onto the condyles of the tibia so the load can be evenly carried on down. Um, it also obviously helps the knee rock, um, the rocking motion of extension and flexion of the knee. All right, so those are menisci. We, then we have bursa and tendon sheaths. So a bursa is going to be like a ball bearing. We can see a bursa here underneath the acromion, so it's called the subacromial bursa. And it's fluid filled, and imagine your humerus, if you were to raise the humerus up and then back, right? The head of the humerus is also gonna rock back and forth. 
And so the bursa will move with the head of the humerus slightly so that it rolls with it. So it can reduce the friction um, in the movement of the humerus. And so that's what bursa are for. They're re reducing the friction in a small space. And tendon sheaths do the same thing. A tendon sheath is just an elongated bursa that wraps around a tendon. So when you contract and relax your biceps brachii, the tendon's gonna go up and down through a very small space, and that could create a lot of friction, but you're gonna wrap the tendon with this bursa to minimize the stress and minimize the friction. All right, then lastly, we have nerves and blood vessels. So nerves and blood vessels are highly branched within a, a synovial joint. I actually don't have a picture showing that right now, but the reason is because your synovial joints can be in any direction. Think about your elbow, you can, um, Flex your elbow to put your, you know, rest your hand, rest your chin on your hand. When you do that, the blood vessels on the anterior side of your arm would be collapsed and maybe the nerves will be pinched. But since they're highly branched, it can still reach the, the elbow joint through the posterior side. So the redundancy provides alternate pathways to get to the joint. So if the joint is in one position, it's not going to completely block off blood supply or nerve supply. All right, so that ends for part one. We'll pick up part two in the next um, lecture.